Hi, this is a Vexbarn video about a 1987 Ardent Titan graphics supercomputer we have in our collection. This was the first vector processor based supercomputer that came with an integrated graphics system and when this was released it was the fastest graphics system in the world. As we zoom out we see the front of the machine here. And here we have a shot from the back and we can see the large fans already. So I'm going to open up this machine and fortunately I have this set of keys. So to open the front I just need to turn those keys and then you can see the front of the machine. So at the top there's two sleds that hold hard disks and a tape drive. And then there's the SCSI cabling that goes to the back plane of the machine and that's what all the cards plug into. At the bottom there's a power supply and then you've got some pretty big cables for the 5 volts. So these are the sleds that hold the drives and as you can see there are currently no drives in the left shed sled. The SCSI cabling and there's the back plane that all the cards plug into. And then finally at the bottom of course there's that pretty large power supply, although it's not nearly as large as some other supercomputers we have. Opening the unit from the back it gets a little bit more interesting. So let's get a little closer again. So here at the top those two smaller fans are the back of those drive sleds and then below that are the two larger fans for the main card cage. And then below that are the cards, so there's CPUs, memory, I.O., graphics, and again at the bottom there's this power supply. And as you can see all the card slots are labeled. So I'm going to take some of these cards out and tell you a little bit about what you can see there. So there's two thumb screws to take each cards out, one at the top and one at the bottom, which I'm slowly unscrewing here. And the first card I'm taking out is the I.O. card. So this card holds the serial ports, real-time clock, um, SCSI controllers, everything that has to do with I.O. except video. So this card is mostly I.O. related stuff. Um, there's some UARTs, there's things like a parallel port on there, there's some SCSI controllers. So quite a lot of smaller logic chips on this card. I'm going to carefully put it back and take out one of the CPU slots. So this machine has two CPUs. Unfortunately one of the two CPUs is not working right now and we're still trying to figure out if that is something that we can fix or not. Now these CPUs are vector processors. There's at the top of the board you can see the custom gate arrays that make up the vector part of the processor. So the vector processor is capable of multiplying and adding um, several numbers at the same time. And then at the bottom that plug-in card holds an R3000 MIPS chipset which is used to process scalar instructions. So when the computer is running normal code it's that part of the processor that's active but once it starts executing this vector code then the vector part becomes active and the vector part also plays a big role in graphics display. This is one of the memory boards so at the left of the board you see all these rows of these flat um, single inline chips. Those are the actual memory modules. And then in the middle you see a lot of gate arrays. So some of those are for error checking and correcting codes and the other ones are for interboard interleaving because this machine can do up to 16-way interleaving of the memory modules in order to uh, access memory faster. All the memory is dual ported, 
and there are actually two memory buses in the system. There's a read-write pipeline that gets used by the scalar processor and that also gets used for vector writes. And then there is a second separate vector read pipeline. And that way the vector processor can get its data in quickly over two buses and write data back over one bus. So this is the main uh, graphics processor. So at the top you see quite a lot of memory again. This is the video RAM. And then all these gate arrays are raster processors and geometry engines. And then at the bottom near the output connectors there are four chips which are the um, digital to analog converters for the video signal. There's four of them. Three of those are for the video outputs and or the RGB outputs and one of them is for a composite output that is output on an auxiliary um, port. And that can then be used to connect to a VCR to record a signal from the system. Now this system does not only have the base graphics board, it also has an additional graphics card or a graphics extension card which I'm unscrewing right now. And as we'll see in a minute, this card consists of more video memory and more of those raster processors. This card also has an additional set of uh, RGB outputs on it as well as GenLock input. To connect the supercomputer to the workstation area, there is this cable. And this cable was used so that you could put the supercomputer in your server room and have your workstation at your desk. So there's uh, connectors here for keyboard and mouse, video, um, stereo, and for some serial ports. So the video plugs into the graphics card as does the stereo port. And then on the I.O. board we have serial ports and we have the keyboard and mouse interface cable. Let's follow where that cable goes. And while we're following this cable, we notice that this is a custom-made cable for our computer. So the cable eventually ends at this junction box. And this junction box is what all the peripherals at the workstation plug into. So there's a load of connectors here on the front as well as on the back. And this connects to the keyboard, the mouse, and this is an old optical mouse, so it's got two lights, one red, one infrared, and a mouse pad with a special pattern that is used to then sense the movement. And without this special pad, the mouse simply doesn't work. There's also a knob box or a dial box. These are dials that you can use to rotate or zoom in or um, translate an image on the screen. And then finally, of course, there's the monitor itself. This is a large and pretty heavy 19-inch monitor. So this is what the whole workstation setup would look like. And this monitor is one of the heaviest monitors we have in the collection. And there's something else that's special about it. And if we zoom in in the text on the bezel, it tells us that this is a stereo bezel that needs to be removed before trying to move the monitor. And because this bezel reflects a lot, we're going to take it off. And when we take it off, we can see that it's a almost clear glass pane, but there's an electrical connector on that. And this is actually a very large liquid crystal display that sits in front of the actual monitor. And it will polarize the light that comes from the monitor. And we can run this monitor in stereo mode. And then if you wear a pair of um, stereo glasses like the ones issued in the cinema, then your left image, your left eye will see one image and your right eye will see the next image. And so it will alternate. So you can have actual stereo display. So time to turn the machine on, I think. We need to slide this front down, and that exposes the tape drive, as well as two keyholes, and one of them is used to turn on the machine. So when we turn it on, the machine will come to life, and the Ardent logo will 
light up. At the back of the unit we see all these boards come to life and start running their diagnostics. And every board that's finished its diagnostic will bring on a little green LED at the top. So there we see the CPU that doesn't uh, complete its test. These are the memory modules. And then there is the processor. And when you see that running light go up and down at the bottom of the CPU, then you know that the CPU's finished initialization is now actually executing code. So back over to the workstation side of things, and back to the moment we turn the machine on. So we see a brief flash across the screen, and then we see this blue pattern that emerges as the video card goes through its self-test. In a minute that will disappear, and when it does we see the prompt startup. So let's get a little closer. Um, so it prints out a list of the boards that it's found in the system. There's a help command that will show you all the different commands that you can type at this prompt. We can um, show the firmware version and we can also show all the environment variables. And of course from here we can boot the system. So when we boot the system it enters a small standalone shell that then loads the Unix file from the hard disk. So let's zoom in a little further again because the Unix terminal window is quite small compared to the size of the monitor. So again we see some diagnostics, a little bit of information about the cards, about the disks, about the CPU. And then we get into the boot. And of course, the first thing that happens is the um, root file system gets checked. So it goes through this file system check. And that's done. And then we're in single user, user mode. So this system always comes up in single user mode. And from here, we need to type init2 to get into multi user mode. When we get into multi-user mode, the first thing that happens is that the remaining file systems will get checked. And this system has a number of file systems, some user file systems and an optional software file system. So these texts, uh, tests actually take a while. So we're getting quite close to the end of multi-user initialization now. The network has been um, started and it tells us the system is ready and now we can log in. So we log in as root. Not recommended, but I'm allowed to do it. And then to start the graphics environment we need to type start x and that will start x windows. Now there's a little um, cross pattern on the screen here and that in combination with the camera we're using generates a sort of hallucinogenic moiré pattern on the screen. So as X, X starts, we'll see different windows come up. And this code that's executing at this point still all runs on the scalar processor, uh, which is why it isn't quite as fast as you might expect from a supercomputer. So here we have X windows up. And now that we're all logged in, let's run a little example code that came with the Dore graphics library. And this is just a small demonstration of the 3D graphics capability. So we have this little thing here that looks like a Pringle chip. Maybe this came from the Pringle development lab. And using the knob box, we can turn this image in and rotate it in real time. And back in 1987, this was quite impressive for a computer. But as we'll see a little later on this video, we can do even more impressive things. This machine was also unique because it was the only system to ever be offered together uh, with MATLAB as part of its bundled software. So let's bring up version 3.5 of MATLAB. And I'm also going to start an XLOAD application to give us a bit of an idea of how busy the CPU is. So we're in MATLAB and we're just going to run one of the classic demos that's been part of MATLAB since almost forever. 
and those of you who have worked with MATLAB will have seen this image before. So this calculates a nice little function and draws a 3D graph. Um, and for a 1987 machine it did it quite fast. Now one of the other pieces of software that this particular machine came with when I got it was a piece of software called Biograph which was used for molecular analysis. And we're going to start the Biograph application now and get it to display a few molecules on the screen. And this is one of the example files that Biograph came with. So first of all there's the licensing screen that tells us who this software was originally licensed to. And we'll just wait a little bit because there needs to be, there's quite a bit of housekeeping that goes on in the background while this application starts. And then we get the main windows. So now it's loading the file we told it to load from the disk and in a minute it will draw this nice set of molecules on the screen. So each color here represents another molecule. And now I'm going to add a surface to this molecule. So not only do we see these lines that connect the center of each atom, we'll also see the outline of the atoms and of the entire molecule. And now using the dial box we can actually rotate this molecule on the screen in real time. And to my knowledge there was no other computer in 1987 that was capable of doing this in real time with such a complex image. So there's a tremendous amount of 3D calculations that happens in the background as we turn this knob, but the image on the screen ro responds to the knob rotation so quickly that you can't really tell that the computer is spending any time doing these calculations. And this is what you needed a graphic supercomputer for back in 1987. If you want to know more about the collection, please visit www.vaxbarn.com.